All right, we are going to continue on reading the Wonka okay. story. And we were on chapter four. Always read the small print. Willie walked back to the wash house. His mind whirring as it always did. There was a new chocolate idea or two bouncing about in there along with a pressing problem to solve. A big one. How to wow at the Gowers Gourmet and convince them to let him sell his chocolates. For as long as he could remember, the dream of the Gowers Gourmet had kept him going. No matter what sadness or gloom the world threw at him, he could conjure up that one dream and live it, live in it for a while. And he could wander happily through it, the last thing he and his mother had imagined together. He wasn't going to let that be replaced with this new memory of heroes who turned out not to be heroes at all. There was always a way to turn things around. He was confident his imagination would conjure up something perfect. It had never let him down yet. Bleacher was closing the wash house blinds when he arrived, and Mrs. Scrubbit was inside. Sit in the shadows, sipping her stinky warm water. Evening, Mr. Wonka, she said. How'd it go? Willie sighed. Oh, not quite as well as I hoped. Oh, dear, she said, and then she rose eagerly to her feet. Well, I'm afraid we do have to settle up now. Thankfully, the room's taken care of, Willie said. I believe we said a sovereign. He pulled the single, so single sovereign from his pocket and placed it on the counter. Mrs. Scrubbin's eye twitched excitedly. For the room, yes, but you have incurred one or two extras during the course of your residency with us. I have? Willie says his nose wrinkling as he desperately searched his mind for what those extras might be. Mrs. Scrubbin opened her ledger and started toting up his bill. Yes, you have. There was a glass of warm water you had when you arrived, and then if I remember rightly, well, you warmed your cockles by the fire. You did indeed, Mrs. Scrubbin, Bleacher growled. Willie looked nervously at the answer as Bleacher bolted the door. Cockle warrior's answer, see, Mrs. Scrubbin said. Use the stairs to get to his room and all, Bleacher added. Oh, well then, you got your stair charge. Mrs. Scrubbin said as she scribbled furiously in her ledger. And that's first step, I'm afraid, up and down. Now tell me, Mr. Wonka, did you happen to use the mini bar? Willie raised an eyebrow. Was a mini bar? Mini bar of soap, Bleacher clarified. By the sink, Mrs. Scrubbin added helpfully. Willie winks. I might have, briefly. Hoo-hoo, Bleacher cried. See, even Bleacher knows you never touched the mini bar, and he was raised in a ditch, Mrs. Scrubbin said. And your mattress, higher linen, lace, pillow pelly, you're looking at 10,000 sovereigns. I don't, I don't think you could do that, Willie said, nervously thumbing his cane. Mrs. Scrubbit flashed to him a rotten smile. All in the small print, dearie. I don't have 10,000 stars, Willie said. I only have one. Bleacher grabbed Willie by the collar and hissed. Then we have a problem, Mr. Wonka. You'll need to work it off in the wash house at a sovereign of the day, Mrs. Scrubbit said brother. But 10,000 stars, Willie stared. That's 27 years, Mrs. Scrubbit said. Four months, Bleacher grunted. Mrs. Scrubbit barred her teeth and 16 days. Then before Willie could protest, Bleacher hoisted Willie into the air and hurled him down the laundry chute. Urgh! He screamed as he slid into the bowels of the wash house and landed with a thump in a basket. He sat squashed among the laundry sets, cursing himself for not spawning the sign sooner. I should have listened to that young girl, Willie groaned. What was her name? Noodle, Carol replied, and much to Willie's surprise, he peeked out of the car to see an older gentleman in a small tweed suit standing there. He looked out of place among the mangles and hand sheets and bubbling batch trailing vast lumps of laundry like someone had plucked him from an office and accidentally dropped him there. You must be Mr. Wonka, he said, as he pushed up his glasses and then his hand. I'm Abbotson Crutch Charlie Cat, at least I was. Now I er a tall and smiling woman wearing soap denim overalls came over and thrust out a hand to help him from the laundry vats. Abbotson runs to the place, she said as Willie struggled his way out. And you best do as he says, or you'll answer to me, Piper Benz, plumber by trade. Accountant plumber, Willie mumbled, ripening his brow. The air was thick with soap, and the whole place was horribly hot. 
And I'm Larry Chucklesworth, King of Boys, and a man stepped out from behind a colossal stack of folded towels. He had a curly wig and big bulbous shoes. He spun his bow tie and greeted, I'm a clown, in case the shoes don't make it obvious enough. Professional clown. And this here's Lottie Bell, Piper said, nudging a shy-looking woman forward. Her hair was almost entirely covering her face like she was trying to hide. She was a switchboard operator in her day, weren't you? The woman said nothing, only waved shyly in Willie's direction. She don't talk much, Piper said. So they got you all too, did they, Willie said glumly. Abbas came back his head. I'm afraid so. Each of us found ourselves in need of a cheap place to stay and neglected to read the small print. Willie took off around the room, running his hands across the walls, knocking at band and pulling at pipes. There must be a way out of here. You don't think we've tried, Piper said. There's bars in, on the windows, the dodge on, on the door, and even if you cook it out, that contract is wired tight, Abbott said. I like this joke, Flower, Larry laughed, squeezing some water in his own face. Sorry, that's a clown joke. Much to the surprise of the others, Willie spluttered with laughter. Fantastic, he said, inspecting the little plastic contraption. You think it's just a flower, but it's something different entirely. Oh, Larry, I think we'll get on very well. Larry stared blankly at him, and his positive reaction was the very last thing he expected. I do love ingenious inventions, Willie said, especially ones that make a person smile. If you're not here at Roll Call, Piper said, bringing the conversation back to their imprisonment, Mrs. Scrubber will call the police, and she'll charge you a thousand for the inconvenience. She sank down onto a pile of laundry and put her head in her hands. All of a sudden, Tills barred from beyond the door, making them all jump and fright. All right, everyone, back to work, Abbott said. Come on, Mr. Wonka, I'll show you the ropes. You're in this room over here, on Sud. And so everyone returned to their workstations, and Abbott since led Willie into the Sud's room. It was a dingy little room dominated by two enormous copper beds. Your job is to stir, Mr. Wonka, Abbott just said. Willie reluctantly picked up a huge paddle and started stirring the steam in bed. I already think I've had enough of this, he said coyly, but the workers were too busy scrubbing. Time passed slowly in the wash house. Even though he had only been there for a few hours, it almost felt like days. The workers constantly chatted, scrub, scrub, didn't help matters either. Willie found himself repeatedly glancing at the clock, wondering when the nightmare would end. The smell of soap was sickly sweet, and the wet air made him feel itchy. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the door was unbullied, and Bleacher marked him with a clipper. Bell, Benj, Crunch, Chuggles, with Walker, he growled, taking their names off the list before ordering them upstairs to sleep. I'll be sure not to use the mini boy this time, Willie said, lesson learned. Oh, I wouldn't worry about that, Mr. Wonka, because you won't be getting any more soap, Bleacher said before grabbing Willie by the scarf of his collar and throwing him in the room. Lights out in 30 minutes, he roared as he slammed the door shut. A terrifying man, but an Olympic throw on him that I can only respect. Willie said with a shake of the head, he jumped to his feet and dusted himself off. Taken in his new home, the room was very different from the one he had stayed in on the top floor. There was no whirring fire, no tree on the pillow. It was bare. It was only a rickety old bed, a small desk, and a small broken window. Cold air blasted through the cracks in the glass, making an irritating whistling sound as Willie laid down on the bed to rest his aching bones. He stared up at the dark ceiling, his stomach grumbling with hunger, and his hands staining from the soap. He was trapped. He felt sure he could hear little footsteps, possibly tiny ones, like the noise a bird would make if it had purchased some nice lurking. Tip, tap, tip, tap. It's you again, isn't it? Willie whispered in the darkness. But the footsteps quickened and disappeared. Chapter 5 Silver Linage Willie was finally drifting off to sleep when he heard a loud knock on the door like this. <laughs> Room service came Noodle's voice as the door creaked open. She placed a bucket of slaps on the floor. Told you to read the small print, didn't I? I know, I know, Willie said. It's just, well, I'll be honest, I can't. Can't what, Willie? Noodle asked. Can't read, Willie clarified. No, you're kidding. <gasps> no, you're kidding me, she gasped. Yes, yes, Willie said. Your chocolate can make people fly and you can't read, Noodle cried. Well, he said somewhat defensively, I've been busy with my plan to share Willie chocolates with the world. Oh, right, Noodle said. For everything else, I relied on the kindness of strangers. 
middle left to hollow left. Ha! Huh? And look where that's got you, the staff quarters. At least you've got a bed. Then as if the bed had heard and wanted to make this day even more grim for Willy Wonka, the whole thing collapsed underneath him. He hit the ground the crunch. I'm okay, he squeaked. You had a bed and you don't went on. A desk and a wash basin. That's also your toilet, by the way. Water comes in two temperatures, cold and colder. Willie got up and walked over to the basin where he turned on the dribble of water that came out. Of each was indeed cold and colder. How much do you owe them, Newland? Ten thousand. Count yourself lucky, Newland said. I owe thirty. What? Willie said his eyes wide and just really, How do you owe them money? I thought they found you down the laundry chute. Well, they did, Noodle said. Took me in out of the goodness of their hearts and charged me for the privilege. You wouldn't have thought a one-year-old could sign a contract, but apparently a thumbprint is legally binding. I'm sorry, Noodle, Willie Willis said sadly. If only you didn't have thumbs, or better yet, if only you then put down a nicer laundry chute. It's not so bad, Noodle said. If I keep myself keep my nose clean, I'll be out of here by the time I'm 82. Willie shook his head. What a pair of monsters. That's life, Noodle said. Cruel and horrible, and folks always choose greed over good deed. It's the way of the world. She tipped some slops into a bowl. Enjoy your slop. Come on now, Noodle, Willie said. We are certainly not going to be eating any of that. He went to the other side of the room and fetched his case. What are you doing? Noodle asked. Without taking his eyes off her, he dropped the case on the desk, making it burst so Concert hanging out like a magic toolbox to span and growing pipes on one side and pots on the other. Up popped an array of flats and beakers. There was a miniature gas stove and a self stirring wooden spoon. Seriously, Noodle said, What is that? What are you doing? I'm making chocolate, of course, he said as he began ripping through the strange ingredient. How do you like it? Dark, white, nutty, totally bonkers? Noodle shrugged. I don't know. I've never had any chocolate. Willie froze. What? Noodle said. Never? Willie, never? Willie said in disbelief. Not even the nibble? No, Noodle said. That's horrible, Willie said. Let's fix that immediately. Noodle inch closer. I'd love to try the one that makes you fly. I'm afraid that the rest of my whoever fly stock isn't ready yet, Willie said. Oh, but I have do have one or two other ingredients you might like. He cracked his knuckles and began uncorking the jars and tipping things into a pot. Silver lions will do nicely, made of condensed thunderclouds and liquid sunlight. Helped you see that faint ray of hope beyond the shadow of despair. Just what we both need, wouldn't you say? Noodle watched John completely, enthralled. Did you always want to make chocolate? I always wanted to eat it, Willie said, shaking some ingredients into the pot of the stove. Back when I was your age, my mama was the cook. We didn't have much money. But each week she bought one Coke of it, and by the time my birthday came around, there was enough to make an entire bar of chocolate. And it wasn't just any old chocolate, it was the best. She knew a secret no other chocolatier knew, not even Slugworth. It was a secret that made her chocolate the best in the world. You leaned in closer, but her eyes, her eyes wide. What was the secret, she asked. I never got the chance to ask her, Willie said sadly. What? What happened to her? New Noodle whispered. Willie's eyes were glistening with tears. She died, he said in a whisper, very suddenly. There was no one to look after me, so I boarded a ship, and after traveling the world, here I am. Noodle put a hand on his shoulder. What was she like? Magical, she said. She's the reason I'm here in a way. Well, yeah, Noodle said. That's how it works. Willie gestured around him. No, here, making chocolate. What do you mean? We dreamed I'm coming here and selling chocolate together. I've held on to that dream because, well, my mom once promised that when I shared chocolate with the world, she'd be right there beside me. And I know it sounds silly, but I've always hoped somehow she'll keep that promise. She might even tell me her secret. The case pinged, and Willie leaped from foot to foot excitedly. Get ready, he said, reaching in the pot. You will watch eagerly as he pulled out a perfectly formed chocolate. He shook it in the air to cool it a little. Here, he said, throwing it over the noodle. Try. Noodle caught and cradled it gently in her hands. It was a white chocolate shaped like a club with a beautiful glistening bowl of lightning running through it. She lifted it to her lips and nibbled a small bite, then stopped. Willie leaned closer, gazing hopefully at her. 
Well, he said, I wish you hadn't done that. She whispered, Why not? Willie asked urgently. Don't you like it? I really thought you would like it. No, I like it, Middle said. It's just... Willie leaned closer. What? Now he's dead, I don't have chocolate. It'll be a little harder, she said. Oh, Willie said, and he breathed the sigh, really. That noodle is exactly how you should feel after eating chocolate. He paused, an idea forming. How would you like to have all the chocolate you could eat every day for the rest of your life? A lifetime supply, Noodle said, sounding skeptical. A lifetime, a lifetime supply, Willie really confirmed. Noodle raised a suspicious eyebrow. What would I have to do? Not much, Willie said. Just get me out of here. Noodle laughed. Don't be ridiculous. Shh. It's easy, Willie said. Let me begin at Sally Pace in the room. I'll get someone to cover my shift, and you can smuggle me out in your laundry cart just for a few hours. Mind. Nobody would even know I was gone. What's the point of that, Noodle said. To sell chocolate, of course, Willie said. We'll sweat the profits and pay off Mrs. Scrubbit in no time. It's a nice idea, Willie. It's a great idea, he corrected her. Noodle's face grew serious, but they'll never work. Of course it will, Willie said dismissively. Now eat the rest of your chocolate. She popped the rest in your mouth. You don't understand, she said. As soon as she gulped it down, Mrs. Scrubbit's like a hot. She keeps her beady eyes on everything that comes in and out of the washout, except... Oh, what is it? Willie asked eagerly. No, it's nothing, Noodle said, shaking her head. Well. Willie shrugged. Okay. Huh, Noodle said. Aha, uh -huh, that's the double huh, Willie cheered. That's not nothing. That's the silver lining at work. It's giving you an idea. Okay, Noodle said, her eyes suddenly wide with excitement. So the one time she's ever dropped her guard was when the aristocrat came into the, the laundry, had a castle he couldn't find his way back to or something, and ended up here. He was only asking for directions, and she was all over him like a rash. It was disgusting. That's it, Willie cried. All we have to do is fi find her an aristocrat and slip out while she's distracted. He popped a silver lion in his, in his mouth. Yeah, but where are we going to find an aristocrat, Noodle said. Huh, Willie said instantly. Noodle moved closer. Huh. Huh, Willie said again. A double huh, Noodle cried with delight. Have you got a pencil and paper? Willie asked quickly, his eyes darting around the room and searched search away. Because I've got a marvelous idea. Chapter 6. The Vault In the dead of night, the chief of police walked alone through the town square. His big leather boots crunched loudly against the frosty ground and his pace was slow but deliberate. Like he had walked the route a million times before, he passed the frozen fountain and made his way to the cathedral, his mustache twitching, eyes wide as, wide as, as, as if he were possessed. When he had reached the door, he raised his fists and pounded the wood in a strange series of knots like this. The door creaked open and out flooded the sound of Latin chant, months barely visible in the flickering candlelight, glittered up, up and down the aisles as if they were flying. Keep up the chant, fellows, the chief said. You sound terrific. He quickened his pace, eyes fixed on the confession booth in the far corner. It was an ornate box divided down the middle and housed in two seats, which were concealed by a heavy curtain. The chief was so large he had to squeeze himself into the booth sideways. He plunged himself down and turned to the priest waiting inside and said, Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned in a humdrum tone as if he wasn't even really trying. I've had a hundred and fifty of these chocolates since my last confession. Then he did a peculiar thing. He slid the priest the chocolate. Temptation is very hard to resist, the priest whispered as he took the chocolate and inspected it, giving it a sniff. You'd say that again, the chief said. The priest gave the chocolate one final sniff and nodded his approval. Then he pulled the lever on the wall. And immediately, the whole confession booth rumbled and grumbled like an old car. And the chief's side of the booth began to lower. The chief crossed his legs and sat back casually as if it were the most normal thing in the world. Slowly like an elevator, it descended and disappeared under the floor. The chief emerged into a cripplet by dim candlelight and was greeted by a guard. Evening, chief, she said, as she unbolted a thick metal door and pushed it open for him. Beyond was a core line with pipes, bells, and gauges, like the bells of a factory. The chief strolled through confidently. He knew where he was going. Soon the corridor opened up into a room where cocooning 
three tall armchairs sat three familiar figures. Slugworth finished scribbling in a small green ledger and looked up at the chief. Next to him, Fickle Gruber was mar making himself a chocolate martini and probably else with a grossly bayed into an ice cream. Standing behind him was Miss Bonbon, Slugworth's secretary. She was busily flicking through some paperwork and raised her eyes only momentarily to acknowledge the chief's presence. Good evening, all. I bring my invoice, the chief said, brandishing a piece of paper. One chocolatier moved on for the usual fee. Miss Bonbon took the invoice. Slugworth handed her the green ledger and she placed the invoice inside it very carefully. Prognosed to the chief of bots of chocolate. The chief's eyes were suddenly lit with chocolate desires. He grew so wide and hungry, they looked like they might escape from his head and get to the chocolate first. His mouth became a swampy mess of saliva as he lunged for the butts. Oh yeah, that's the good stuff he purred as he scooped the chocolates into his greedy fist. Is there a second layer? Yeah, there is. And a third. No, that's just butts. How would you like to order a few more of these slugger sacks? The chief nodded his mouth now, too ch chock full of chocolate to speak. We think Mr. Wonka requires more than just moving on. He's good, Slugworth muttered. Too good, Prognos added. What's more, he only charges one sovereign of chocolate, Fickle Gruber cried. So anyone can afford him, even the the, the poor, the chief suggested, as he gulped down the last one of the chocolate. Fickle Gruber wretched and raised a handkerchief to his mouth. He doesn't like it when people say poor, Prognos explained. Fickle Gruber wretched again. Sorry, Felix. Prodno said, patting his accomplished shoulder. Sorry for saying poor again, and again just now. Stop saying that, Flicker Gruber pleaded. We want you to send Wonka a message, Slugger said, ignoring the other. Backed up by physical force, Prodno said, that if he tries to sell chocolate in this town again, Slugger said, he's liable to meet with a little accident. In which he dies, Prodno clarified. Fickle Gruber waved his handkerchief. You don't have to say it. We all know it's a death threat. Back with more in a moment. Just making sure we're all on the same page, Prynos said. No one's on your page, Prynos. Fickle Groot were muttered under his breath. Prynos began to rise out of his chair. What's that supposed to mean? Well, I know what it means. Actually, what does it mean? What even is a page? None of us are on pages. Are we talking book pages? Gentlemen, please, Slugworth said. Let's keep it to business, shall we? So what do we what did you say? Do we have a deal, Chief? The chief stood still, the empty box in his hand started to shake. Now look here, fellas, I've always been happy to help in the past, but you've been handsomely comp compensate, Pickle Gruber said. And I appreciate that really really I do, the chief said, something a little over his words. I love your chocolate, especially those little orange ones with the dots on. Sure go down smooth. But that's not the point. The point is, I'm an officer of the law, and lately I've been wondering if this, all this criminality is really suitable for someone in my position. Slugworth's eyes narrowed. I see. I can't just go around and roughing up your competition, the chief said quietly. I'm sorry. The chocolate just changed look, and slowly they rose from their tall chairs, like snakes in long grass. Well now, chief, I'm glad to see you're a man of integrity, Slugworth said. But how about he leaned closer? A hundred of your favorite chocolates. The chief strained, strained to resist, grinning his teeth. I'm actually trying to cut down on chocolates, you know, the kid in shape for the police officer's ball. Slugworth offered his hand. Seven hundred boxes. The chief's eyes brief, briefly lit up. That's a lot, he said. 
His fingers cheek twitched in eagerness to do the deal. I'm sorry, no. Sluggers flipped a big switch on the wall. Suddenly, it was raining chocolates. Great big ones were thudding down all around them. Slugworth offered his hand again and whispered enticingly, 1,800 boxes is more than most could eat. The chief stared down at Slugworth's head, and he found that finally he could resist the chocolate no more. Morals will run things, but this was chocolate. So much chocolate. Deal, he cried. Chapter 7 The Aristocrat the gentle sound of Don Bird singing was shattered by an ear splitting whistle. Willie stepped out of his room, rubbing his eyes, as one by one the workers from the wash house lined up for roll call beside him. He had walked into the room the night before, feeling broken. Manoodle had made him remember that people needed his chocolate, and he shouldn't let anyone scrub it or slugworth or whoever steal his dreams. And so he spent the entire night wide awake, running through all the possibilities of escape. The people of the world needed him to make chocolate not scrub their laundry. If only no one had to do the laundry, if only there was someone, something, who would gladly give the world. Bad first night sleeps, huh? Piper said, wincing at Willie's exhausted face. Oh, yes, not a winky whisper. I drew a, a made-up aristocrat, and I, and I couldn't stop dreaming about the possibilities of today. Piper turned to a biscuit. He's cracked already. Bell, Ben's crunch, chuggles with Wonka, Bleacher shouted, and the workers dutifully Filed down the stairs to the where to the wash house. Bleacher said, "Mrs. Scrubber, Bleacher!" Mrs. Scrubber cried out as they passed. Toilet's blocked again. Bleacher rolled his eyes. Ugh. Ah, Willie said, taking his chance. The unmistakable sound of love. The what? Bleacher's now. Don't tell me you hadn't noticed. Willie whispered, "She's madly in love with you." Bleacher stared at him for saying that seven snow. Mrs. Scrubbit? Willie put on the most serious face. Besides, he lied. And why not? Look at you, a fine figure of a man. You just need to tidy yourself up a bit and get some new clothes. Have a bath. What's a bath? Bleacher said. Oh, a little bit of a scrub, a splash around some soap like the laundry, Willie explained. You could also consider a nice new outfit show off the lights. Bleacher stared off in the distance, and Willie knew that whatever little claws Bleacher had up there in the skull, they were now more certainly turned. Mrs. Scrubbit would be wild, he added, just to make sure. Get in there, Bleacher cried, shaking his head as if he were shaking the nonsense out of it. He showed Willie down the stairs to the wash house, and, but as he started off with an unmistakable sprint and said, Willie felt certain the plan was afoot. Upstairs, Mrs. Scrubbit marched into the shop and screamed, Bleacher! Did you hear what I said about the toilet being blocked? Curse that idle peasant! It's a warm wire fiasco in there. She stopped when she saw Noodle standing in the middle of the room. She wasn't folding laundry. Instead, she was intently studying a piece of paper. What's that? Mrs. Scrubbit sneered. Noodle immediately whipped the paper behind her back. Nothing, Mrs. Scrubbit. Mrs. Scrubbit put her hands on her head and stared. Do you like the coop, Noodle? All right, Noodle cried in mock surrender, holding out the piece of paper so Mrs. Scrubbit could see it. I was collecting laundry for Professor Monocle the other day. He's writing a book about the Bavarian royal family. He's got sketches of noblemen all over as well. And this one looked rather familiar. Mrs. Scrubbit took the bait. She tore the paper from Noodle's hand and inspected it. For a moment, she was silent and worried. That was a drive. She and Willie had cobbled together. Nothing more. But then suddenly the woman burst to life. Holy warm wire, she gasped. It's just like Mr. Bleacher, Noodle said, not furiously. Are you telling me Bleacher's a Bavarian aristocrat? Mrs. Scrubbit screeched. You can't deny there's a certain quiet nobility to one, Noodle said, trying not to laugh. 
Mrs. Scrubbit stared off into the distance. A dozy smile spread across her face. A smile was spread across Noodle's face, too. Then suddenly, Mrs. Scrubbit snapped back to reality. What have you got to smile about? She spat at Noodle. Go get my warm water. She aimed a kick at Noodle, which sent her scurrying away. Immediately, Noodle peeked back around the door, worried Mrs. Scrubbit had come to her senses. Then said the horrible woman was hugging Willie's scrappy drawing inside. Only a few hours later, the smell of fancy soap wafted through the corridors of the wash house, followed by heavy footsteps. Oh, finally, Mrs. Scrubbit shouted. We sure the toilet I've been calling for you. All morning, where have you... She stopped, talking, and her jaw dropped. Where'd you get them dungarees? Mrs. Scrubbit asked, looking from bleacher to the drawing and back again. He was wearing shorts so tight his thighs squeaked as he moved, and he combed his hair in a neat little quiff. Found it all in lost property. Well, he said smoothly, suit me. Not bad, Mrs. Fergrass, trying to keep her cool. Bleacher swifted awkwardly, trying to smile sweetly, but in fact just baring his teeth. Mrs. Scrubbit, he said, can I just say your eyes are like two rabbit droppings in the bullet cluster? Oh, my lord, she oohs, you'll make me blush. Fancy some worm wire, you maggot? Bleacher said, uncorking the bottle with his teeth. Mrs. Scrubbit grabbed the bottle and took a swig, down the le then let the straining water dribble down her chain as she grinned up at him. He plucked a particular juicy worm bit from, his, from her chin and lifted it slowly to his mouth, ripping it with his mouth, making Mrs. Scrubbit shiver with delight. Noodle stood by the door with her fist in her mouth, trying not to laugh and also trying not to be very, very sick. Unlike upstairs down in the washes, everything to be as it was every day, nothing but scrubbing. Then Willie appeared, skipping out of his, of his section. He began to load old bits of laundry equipment into a laundry cart, ropes, and mango rollers. The workers watched him as he heavied the car across the room and disappeared with, with it back into his section. As soon as the door closed, loud bangs and clanks said, I told her he lost it, Piper said, showing the advocates a worried look. The workers inched closer until their ears were pressed against the door. Should we go in, Larry whispered as the band grew louder. I could tell a joke and cheer him up. Suddenly the door flew open and Willie strolled out. Much to their surprise, his trousers had a perfectly cut square bottom in the bottom. Nobody said a thing. They watched as Willie opened the door and held up the missing piece of fabric. Oh dear, Piper said. He's a dead man. Tittles the dodge shot through the air, a mass of muff tail and teeth. And furious drool. Willie ran round and round and circled as Tiddles gave chase, and the others watched on hel helplessly. Woohoo! Willie roared. He ran one more lap and then pelted into his section with Tiddles in hot pursuit. The door slammed shut, and from beyond it came growls and barks and tearing sounds and the clang of metal. Well, what's that sound? Abacus fretted. We've got to do something, Larry said. But all I can offer is jokes. It was Lottie who, without saying a word, stepped forward and kicked open the door. They all ducked, bracing for a dog attack, but nothing came. When they finally looked up, Piper burst into hysterical laughter. Willie had assembled a mass of ropes and pulleys and pipes to create a huge hulking machine, all powered by Tittles running and what looked like a big hamster wheel. Just beyond the dodge, furious jaw, the square from Willie's trousers dangled enticingly on a string. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present a brand new concern of my own creation, an innovation in laundrification. The workers' jaws were on the floor. Let me ask you a question, Willie said. How does Tittles want to spend his time? Run after posse? Now with Willie Wonka's wild and wonderful woof of mag Wonka Walker, don't make me say it again. He gets to run while I have fun. It's genius, Piper said when they proved enough. You're a genius, Wonka. Right, now that's done. I'm just popping out for a bit. Willie said that he sauntered over to the dumb waiter that carried the freshly wired Freshly washed laundry back up to the shop. You can't just leave, Piper said. This ain't no hotel. I'll be back by roll call, Willie said. Then he jumped into the dumbwaiter, grabbed the laundry bag, and wriggled into it, pulling it up to his neck. While well, I'm away, Tittles had kindly agreed to scrub. The dumbwaiter rolled, rolled up and out of the wash house, and, he got smacked, and his god smacked friends waved a feeble goodbye like this. With a pain, Willie arrived in the shop to find Shirley and Bleacher giggling together in the corner. Mrs. Scrubber was sitting on Bleacher's knees, asking things like, How many jewels do, do you own, and what castle in Bavaria? He was replying with answers like, Is this stone in my shoe as a jewel? And what's Bavarian? But she was too enamored to notice. Noodle raced up, her face a picture of 
pure delight. She shoved Willie's head down into the bag and heaved down him into the car, right under scrubbing and bleachers' noses. She whispered as the pair of them rolled on out of there into the afternoon sun. Once outside, Willie quickly climbed out of the car and dusted himself up. I can't believe a word she said. Now for the next part of the plan, Willie said, wait till you see how much chocolate I made last night. He began rummaging in his hat. We saw this, and then, oh no. He held an empty jar aloft and he eyed it suspiciously. What's going on, Willie? Newell said. Where's the chocolate? Not again, Willie said with a dramatic roll of the eyes. I don't know how to tell you this, but the chocolates have been stolen. Stolen? Noodle said plainly, a sledgehammer of suspicion. Mm hmm, Willie said. Excuse me. Mm hmm, Willie said. Noodle crossed her arms. Who by? The little orange man, Willie said gravely. What? Noodle exclaimed. The little orange man with the green hair. Didn't I tell you about him? Willie said, He's my nemesis, Noodle. He's about yay high, comes in the dead and a quiet little footstep. Tip, tap, tip, tap. And then he steals all my chocolate. I've been having them every few weeks for the past, oh, three, four years now? Noodle narrowed her eyes. Really? Oh, yes, Willie said. Sometimes I spy him in, the, in that strange round twitch sleeping wait. Green hair glinting in the moonlight. One day I should capture him, Noodle. Willie, Willie said slowly. And what I do, Willie went on. Willie! Noodle cried. You don't exactly, you don't actually expect me to believe you, do you? Of course I do, Willie said. What other explanation could there be? He waggled the empty jar in her face. I don't know, she said, that you go to sleep dreaming about a little green man. Green hair, Willie corrected. And while you're dreaming it, you're stuff your face with you bleh, you stuff your face with chocolate. Willie got <gasps> How dare actually that does make a lot more sense. Have I been eating my own chocolate? You go through her arms in the air. Why did I even why did I ever think this would work? Willie was still lost in thought. I don't think so. I know if I ate my own chocolate in my sleep. Surely stupid silver lines and you will say, Hey! Willie said. There's nothing stupid about my chocolate. If Mrs. Scrubbit had spied us, I'd be in the coop right now, Noodle cried. Do you have any idea what's that what's that's like? Look, Noodle, I'm sorry, okay? But it's just a setback. We can make more chocolate. The only problem is I'm all out of the milk. Noodle swiped a bottle of milk from the nearest doorstep. But Willie quickly took it off her and played back. Firstly, that's stealing, Noodle, he said strongly, and thirdly, Willie not walking does not use any old cow's milk for this particular creation. I require the milk of a draft. Why a draft? You know, asked. Willie flashed her a smile. So my chocolates are head and shoulders above the competition. Willie noodle opened her mouth to call her, but realized it was easier not to. Fine, she said. As a matter of fact, there's one at the zoo. Fantastic, Willie said, striding off down the alley. But first thing, Noodle said, the zoo isn't that way. Gotcha, Willie said, get changing direction. And Secondly, Noodle said, they're not just going to let you walk in and milk it. Willie stepped down in his tracks and held, held his can on. He tapped the small golden globe on the top of it, and immediately it sprung open, revealing a tiny, perfectly wrapped chocolate. That, my dear Noodle, he said with a mischievous smile, is why we're very lucky the little green-haired man didn't find this. <laughs>